Hello, everyone. Welcome to the All Out Coach Show. This is your laboratory, a continuous quest in which we test and debate ideas, in which every episode is one building block to help us solve some conclusions and test new ones. Today, you are in for a treat because you will hear from an independent, a creative thinker, Donald Ratner, educator, an architect, a lecturer who will spark creativity in your world in regardless of what field you're in. And he has a new book called My Creative Space, which I had the pleasure of reading recently. So, uh, Donald, welcome to All Out Coach. Hi, Tim. Thank you so much for having me on. Really looking forward to our conversation. Thank you. Let's start by going over your background uh, and your career as a framework. Can you explain to us in what really you know stimulated you to be interested in architecture? Well, for that, I think I have to thank mom because she uh, actually was the one who had a very strong interest when I was growing up in architecture. And she would take me around to buildings and quiz me on this or that, you know, aspect of their design and such. So I guess it was in my bloodstream from pretty early on. Uh, and so I chose to pursue that uh, after college and graduate school and then went into practice uh, uh, following my uh, degree uh, in architecture. And then, you know, I practiced for quite a few years kind of doing what architects do, which is designing and seeing buildings built when... Uh, a few years ago, I got a particular project that got me thinking about uh, a, an interesting question or what was interesting to me, which is what's the relationship between our physical surroundings and how we think, feel, and act, and in particular, how we think creatively, how we generate novel and useful ideas, uh, what, we, what we define as creativity. And since then, I've kind of you know, taken the deep dive. There's a whole world out there of people and research and studies and have established a whole series of, you know, relationships between the two that I just found fascinating. And that eventually I figured, you know what, this stuff is all over the map. Some of it's over here, some of it's over there, some of it's accessible to the public, some more scientific uh, community uh, restricted. Um, but what about if I brought it all together, uh, kind of put it into words that non-scientists such as myself could understand and put it out there, and that's what I did, and that was the, uh, the the resulting form in the book that you mentioned, my creative space. Yeah, you mentioned you're a non-scientist, and although I have a more of a scientific background in my career, uh, when I first heard you and watched you present the book, uh, you reminded me of some of my favorite best professors uh, in my days in, in wow. college and high school. Uh, and you presented uh, this uh, topic, which was uh, so foreign to me and so new in a very scientific light that captured a lot of my attention. And that uh, I, I think uh, begs the question, how do you explain evidence-based design, which was a concept that was new to me coming from evidence-based medicine world. So can you explain to our audience, um, you know, the, the evidence-based design concept? Sure. So the idea be behind EBD, as we can refer to it for short, mm -hmm. is that in addition to the sort of traditional criteria by which we, and it doesn't matter if you're an architect or you're just figuring out your own workspace at home or at the office, make our decisions about what this space is going to be like. And that could be our, you know, aesthetic preferences. It could be function. It could be budget, technology, uh, history, if that's uh, relevant to the situation, the context, the larger context. We should add one more criteria, which is what does the scientific literature tell us about how those decisions are going to impact on our behavior, right? Because now we know a lot more about the things that we see or hear or feel or touch, how they change the way we think. And so if you know what the outcome is going to be to a particular element within your space, you can reverse engineer what your space wants to look like to align with your desired outcomes. So uh, rather than just kind of working intuitively as much as that is important and using your imagination and just kind of what feels right, we can also look to this body of research to guide us 
in our decision making. And there's a lot out there that we can draw from. Uh, and it's really there for anybody to see, although at least I've tried to pull it together as much as possible in this particular book. And thank you for those comments about, you know, almost feeling a little, I guess, professorial in a way. I mean, a lot of what I'm trying to do here, obviously, is to share the knowledge, share the information, help others by teaching, speaking, et cetera, and writing, yeah. uh, and therefore getting the information out there to a, more, to a wider audience. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I come from a family of teachers and professors, so I have uh, uh, the utmost respect for the teaching profession uh, and for teaching any craft or any science, period. My, my vision for All Out Coach uh, is to be able to inspire people to uh, express abstract ideas in exact terminology, right, and to converge our thinking, where I focus on more spectra, on thresholds, on cycles over time, rather than boxes or categories that we often uh, try to label people or concepts in. In fact, I make it a point to introduce this podcast in a new way every single time. I've made it, you know, that kind of tradition. And that's why I'm so excited to have you uh, here. So let's, let's start by talking about when, when are we most creative based on your research? Right? Yeah, that's, that's a interesting topic. Um, so uh, first of all, I would sort of bring out the concept of what are called chronotypes, C-H-R-O-N-O -O types, chronology, time, clearly. And what seems to be the case is that people tend to fall into one of, in, in, in one book that I've read, four categories of chronotype, depending on when you're at sort of peak performance. So there are, of course, the classic morning larks, right? The kind of nine to, to, to let's say, one o'clock, which is your kind of peak performing times. There are the night owls, of course, who love to work at night and just are banging away at whatever it is they do. And then there's a couple in between, which have different terminologies, sort of an early afternoon, late afternoon. So the first thing I suppose people want to sort of know about is, well, what kind of chronotype am I? And there are even online, I think, certain questionnaires you can fill out to actually try to hone in on what particular type you are. But the one I think probably most of us will belong to is also the one I assign myself to that kind of morning lark um, phase where you talk about roughly nine to one as certainly as far as idea generation goes, creative work goes, seems to be, you know, our, our best moments. And there can be a whole number of um, explanations for this, but one of them ties into, let's call it the solar trajectory, right? The path, think about the path of the sun as it rises in the morning, peaks midday, and then starts to decline into, uh, into evening time and sunset. You'll also notice, of course, that the sun changes color through the day. When it first rises, it, it's a pretty warm, you know, that kind of reddish tone, but it pretty quickly turns into a bluish cast. Uh, then peaking around lunchtime or so, and then it starts to go more neutral, sort of a whitish, and then finally back to that amber, fiery color we see at beautiful sunsets. Well, our bodies, biologically speaking, are very tuned in to that color series, a series of color changes. And because uh, the morning hours have a lot of blue in the light, blue has been associated through research with improved idea generation. So the idea here would be that because we're getting the most amount of blue light, our brains are responding, and not only in terms of how we're thinking, but hormonally, right? Waking up versus falling asleep at night. These are all tied to the solar cycles. So one problem, of course, today is with ourselves being on screen a lot, uh, especially with phones, smartphones, the screens tend to be fixed at a very high blue quotient. So we are seeing blue light from morning literally to night, which mm -hmm. does kind of bad things for our brains because our brains were bioengineered through millions of years of evolution right. to respond to this changing cycle. If we see blue, blue, blue all day long, we can get very uh, anxious. We can experience sleeplessness. If folks uh, uh, have endured yeah. any of that, a lot of it is because of this light. So one remedy I talk about in the book is to try to bring in color changing bulbs. If you're talking about your home office, 
where they can literally go from, they can track the solar trajectory from warm to cool to back to warm again. If you're in an office, there are systems that can be made to do that. Obviously that involves a, a greater effort in terms of engineering the light and so forth. But that's just one way to um, try to get back to our sort of original state of nature in a way, because that is the best for our mental and physical well-being, from creativity to health and happiness as well. Yeah, those are great practical tips that, that I think uh, many of us can apply. Uh, actually, acquire some of these, uh, you know, color-changing bulbs, right? Or, or... Uh, yeah, in fact, on your phone, uh, I have an iPhone, so there is a setting where you can actually—I think it's called Night Shift, where the color of the screen will change throughout the mm -hmm. day. Uh, to that more amber color at night. It also impacts even, you know, if you're painting your bedroom uh, at home, uh, you might want to look at using an amber color or a warmer color to simulate sunset because your brain is kind of reading, ah, now it's time to go to sleep because I'm in this sort of warm uh, space versus say uh, your workspace or your living space, which might be cooler colors. So these things can mm -hmm. permeate into almost every decision you make about your physical space. Now, if you don't have any windows and you don't have uh, in your office and you don't have any light coming in in the early uh, part of the day, what are some of your recommendations? The brain will respond to representations of real things as much as they will respond to the real things themselves. So for example, you could put up a poster or artwork of a natural landscape or of the outdoors. Your brain actually will say, oh, okay, there's, a, there's nature out there, there's a world out there. I feel a little better than being totally enclosed in a blank space where I don't have mm -hmm. access to the view outside. Uh, also the sense of just openness uh, is also important to our sort of mental state. That is the more open we feel our space to be, the more, and think about how we use language, the more open-minded we tend to become, the more open to new ideas, new ways of doing things, yeah. new ways of looking at things. So even if you're in a space without a window, again, look to compensate for that by adding these other elements, these landscapes, these representations of outdoor space, if you have tall ceilings, they've even studied the effect of ceiling height on our sort of mental um, uh, state. Tall ceilings of about 10 feet or higher have been shown to actually improve idea generation because we get that sense of being in a space larger than ourselves. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have 10 foot ceilings, you know what? You can sort of reinforce the verticality of your space. If you had a wall covering or you painted vertical stripes on your wall, if you had a tall mirror and you leaned it against the wall, that sense of verticality, as well as bouncing uh, the view up into the ceiling, all this can create the illusion in the brain of greater spaciousness. So it doesn't just mean you have to have a large space. It just has to have that feeling of not being closed in because when we, mm -hmm. when we feel closed in, we'll think about closed mindedness, obviously the new ideas. Now I should say, remember we're dealing with sort of two halves of the brain. It's not all about idea generation. We've also got our analytical side, right? Mm -hmm. That left brain thinking. So if you happen to be, let's say, uh, looking over the spreadsheets for your business or your profit and loss, or you're doing your taxes, you actually wanna use that left brain and analytical type thinking. You wanna heighten that type of mental operation more than mm -hmm. the mind wandering, let's see where we go exploratory side of our mm -hmm. brain. So we might have different conditions depending on the task at hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that means that uh, if you want to be a little bit more creative, start early uh, in the first half of the day and, and maybe save some of the more analytical skills for the afternoon for later. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, right? If you are of that morning lark, uh, type now if you're the night owl and that's and and this should be said you know right up front with all evidence-based design at the end of the day of course uh, ebd the data is culled from large populations of people right you don't bring yeah. in three people run an experiment and say there i proved right. something you yes. want 50 100 500 sometimes in some of the studies that i've looked at because you're trying to find the sort of mean the average the archetypal human being but of course, none of us are archetypal human beings. We're people, we're all over the map. Some are introverts, some are extroverts, all of the differences that go into being human. So if you find that some of these techniques don't work for you, have the opposite effect, set them aside and do what works for you, test it out. Some will definitely apply, but again, we're human, some may not. So think about different ways of applying some of these. And also, you know, I, I write about 48 different techniques in the book. Clearly you don't have to do all 48. They have found through study that just one change in the environment can make all the difference in how you think, feel, and act. 
and you recommend getting the hardcover book, right? Mm-hmm. Because of just how real it is and because of the photography and the, the colors, right? I do. You know, listen, I'm a big uh, Kindle reader myself. I love e-books because I can obviously carry them around wherever I am and access them. And I like mm-hmm. to highlight and write notes. But in this case, yes, you mentioned photographs. There's over 200 of them of different interiors and all different kind of styles and budgets and all that kind of stuff. But there's a, there's a visual feast here, obviously, because we are at the end of the day dealing with as much visual phenomenon as anything else. So I try to use the pictures to reinforce what I write about. So in this case, yeah, that kind of tangible uh, material experience of the book is, I think, uh, hard to match in the ebook. But hey, you know, you can get both. I've had some people get both and they write their notes in the ebook one, but they enjoy, you know, cracking the hardcover as well. Yeah, I see. And it's available everywhere, including Barnes and Nobles, I know. Rend and- Amazon, Rend. all the you know customary online uh, vendors and in, in bookstores as well, uh, depending on where you're at. I personally prefer books that are hardcover. I have some other books in Kindle. You know, the way I approach technology is that it doesn't um, necessarily make you more intelligent. It increases your exposure, whether it's Kindle or other digital, you know, platforms you have. But you need to analyze it, and and you know if you if you want to maybe have uh, your walls in blue, lighter shades in order to mimic the environment uh, or the biophilic, right? This biophilic design, I think that you as you referred to it in the book, uh, I think I think there may be some good advantages of also having the, the, the physical book as well. Um, oh yeah, clearly, yeah. and we we exist in a physical world. We need those kind of neural nutrients, as I call them, those inputs. You mentioned biophilic design, you know, we we might want to touch on that a little bit. So for for folks out there, biophilia, the term uh, literally translates into love of natural things, right? Bio, nature, philia, love. And the idea behind it is this, what's called biophilia hypothesis, which that uh, something formulated by evolutionary psychologists, which basically says that we human beings have been sort of genetically engineered through evolution, as I mentioned earlier, to have this, call it natural connection, natural affinity for the natural world. Because look, we spent 5 million years evolving uh, into the homo sapiens that we are, 99.999, and you could just keep going on with the nines percent of that time, we are in purely natural environments, right? There's no buildings, there's no mediating elements to protect us, to keep us out of the rain or air condition or space. So it's just us and nature. And as a result, our whole being is so tied into nature that the moment we kind of go in the opposite direction as we have for the last, let's call it a couple of hundred years, right? Which is really the flick of an eye in the, in the big uh, time scheme of things. We've gone completely opposite to where we all spend upwards of, and this was even before COVID, 90% of our time indoors, right? Right. Um, because that's the way we live. We're not going yeah. back to caves. We're not going back to trees, but What happens is when we come indoors, we run the risk of uh, depriving ourselves of these nature-based inputs Mm -hmm. that we can only get when we can either see or more or better still be in nature. But there's lots of ways we can kind of restore that balance and avoid some of the negative health uh, outcomes and and mental outcomes that result from not having enough nature. So it could be anything like, right, you can see right behind me, the color of our walls again, or the colors of our palette in the furnishings and so forth. Besides blue, the other color that's been linked to heightened creativity is green for the obvious reasons that it connects us with organic nature, the idea of growth, the idea of creativity Mm -hmm. on kind of a global scale. Uh, You can literally have a desk plant on your desk at work or at home. You can have those landscape images again. You can also, you know, we tend to focus a lot on what we see, and that is important because about 80% of the information we get about our surroundings comes through the sense of sight, but let's not lose sight of the other four senses, the other four major senses, uh, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch being the full Mm -hmm. five. So People use scents, you know, literally aromatics, uh, sticks, even um, aromatherapy, it's sometimes called to get that sort of nature input to stimulate the brain and make it feel good about its surroundings to say that there's life out there, I can continue to exist, I can continue to survive. This is our sort of evolutionary selves needing that 
sense that we're in a good place, uh, literally and figuratively. Also, one of the tips I think you mentioned in the book is uh, traveling in time and in distance, uh, having some pictures of places that are far away that put you in that uh, creative kind of space, right, in, in, in mind. Yeah, this was this was for me some of the most uh, fun and and uh, interesting discoveries in the course of my research. So yeah, so we think about distance and we tend to do so in sort of physical dimension terms, you know, big big spaces or a sense of yeah. expansiveness, but the brain will respond to other units of distance such as time, right? Because you think back to when you were a child uh, or something happened long ago. Well, they've actually done studies and this is typically how these will work. So they'll have two groups of subjects and they'll have one as a control group. And the other one will be the, the one that's sort of primed as it's called brain priming with some kind of cue that they wanna see, does this you know, lead to greater analytic or creative thinking? So in this case, they had one group come in and they would be given their creativity assessment test. There's a whole industry that tests for creative uh, ideas, how mm -hmm. original people are in response to certain tasks and problems they're asked to solve. And they just do this first group just comes in, does their thing, and then they leave. Then they bring in a second group. And in this case, before they took the test or the assessment test, they were asked to think back in their own lives, just to think back to when, as I say, when you were a child or something, give them two minutes or whatever. And then they sat them down for the test. Well, what do you know? That second group actually outperformed the creativity on their creativity assessment test in the first group. Same exact exercises, same yeah. basically people, same environment, just thinking back opened up your brain, so to speak, your mind to the sense of there's a partness, there's separation between now and then. And by the way, they've done the same thing in the reverse direction. If you think forward, you know, sci-fi, futuristic yeah. thoughts, uh, you can again get that sense of expansiveness. So time, right. and that can be conveyed through visual means. So if you put up old travel posters, for example, from the 1920s or 30s, you could be getting sort of a triple whammy because first you might see that landscape images, a lot of them say from, you know, visit the south of France or Greece or wherever. So right. you automatically get that sense of physical distance, but you see it visually as well and in time because of that uh, change of era, the, the aesthetics change as well. So really fascinating stuff. Speaking of the virtual and the natural, the love of the natural environment, I do have to ask you this because I'm just curious. In the period of time now, in which uh, we have so many different ways to communicate, yet so many of us are feeling lonely, right? And we spent more time alone than ever. We're, we have virtual meetings, Zoom meetings, Microsoft Teams meetings, right? And many people do resort to using these virtual backgrounds, right? I don't personally, but uh, I just want to, uh, you know, ask for your opinion or any commentary on, on yeah. that. Um, yeah, interesting question. Um, so, you know, I can, I can sort of see both sides of the coin. I mean, I can mm -hmm. see wanting to, first of all, you know, show your own space, show yourself in right. real three-dimensional uh, context. And also because it says a lot about yourself, right? You're sending a message to folks that you're communicating with. This is especially from when you're working from home. Yeah. Um, you know, this is what I... This is how I envision the world because home in a lot of ways is our model for how we would like the world to be. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, I could also see whether it's for reasons of privacy, which has obviously right. come to the fore with Zoom, um, to, you know what, I have an ideal, I haven't been able to realize it in my own physical space, but this background is, is my ideal vision of where I would like to be or what mm -hmm. I would like to be or what I would like mm -hmm. to convey about myself. So yeah. I could kind of see it going both ways. The one thing I would say, though, with Zoom is that it's, it's first of all, you get some kind of distortion sometimes where people's bodies disappear yeah. with the virtual backgrounds. And I always yeah. I get a little freaked out when I see that. It's just too too surreal. So I don't know if that's a problem with bandwidth or your network or something, but make sure you have enough uh, bandwidth to, to pull it off. Um, and then obviously the choice of background make, makes a big difference uh, as well. But yeah. it's, it, you know, it's a whole fascinating world, the whole psychology of trying to relate to people when you're not in the same physical space with them mm -hmm. uh, and our body language. You know, I think it's particularly tough in terms of work environments where you have multi-person meetings and the dynamic completely changes 
when you're no longer in a room and you can see people through your peripheral vision, you can see body language, you can kind of get the whole sense of people versus, you know, he's kind of seeing a snapshot one at a time and patching it together. It's a totally different experience. I don't know that our brains are quite wired yet to pull it all back together again, but time will tell, I guess. How you think is how you see is what you referred to, alluded to earlier. And uh, that's why I'd like to ask you about the seesaw effect uh, or the thinking. Uh, and it's, it's impact ultimately on how we make decisions, how creative we are, how productive we are, and how effective our decisions really are. Can you explain that seesaw effect that you mm -hmm. describe in your book? I think it would be interesting for the audience. Right. So um, uh, it's it kind of a two-way street between what we're doing at a given moment and how we're thinking and feeling and acting clearly as well. So I use as an illustration in my talks in the book, think about a seesaw. So two things about a seesaw, of course, is first, uh, a real, real seesaw, first of all, they are finite in length. And that just is to remind ourselves that, you know, our brains are very powerful for sure, but they are not infinite in their capabilities. That we have a finite attentional bandwidth, a finite amount of mental energy to allocate to whatever is we're doing, which means we're dealing with a zero sum game. The second thing about seesaws is, as you say, they go up and down, right? Mm -hmm. So I would like you to think of picture a seesaw in your, in your minds, everybody, uh, as being levels to start with. And let's say on the left side, we'll call it uh, unconscious thinking. On the right side, conscious thinking. On the left side, defocused thinking, as it's sometimes referred to. On the right side, focus thinking. So obviously, opposites. And if you want to think of left brain analytic on the left side and right brain creative on the right side, all of those are basically referring to the same thing. So think about uh, what you're doing at a given moment. Let's say you're pouring over spreadsheets or maybe you're skiing down the side of a steep mountain. Well, what's going to happen to that seesaw is the conscious end is going to go way, way up, which automatically means the unconscious side has to be down because remember, we're talking about a zero sum game here. And why is that? Because you are totally focused on what you're doing. In the case of the skiing, you don't want to, you know, wrap yourself around a tree because you let your mind wander away from what you are dealing with at the given moment. In this terms of spreadsheet, you want to get your numbers right. There's that analytical type thinking. Uh, and as a result, that kind of back of mind, unconscious thinking, the place where a lot of creativity is actually happening, creativity tends to happen at or just below the level of consciousness, it's kind of in the back, uh, literally in the back of mind and not a lot of going on, which is why when you're skiing down the side of a mountain, you don't suddenly go, oh, I know the answer to that problem I've been wrestling with at work the last week. No, that doesn't happen. Whereas, of course, the classic example is you go into a shower you take in your daily shower, you turn on the water and you step inside. And now think about that seesaw, the unconscious, defocused, creative side is gonna go way, way up, the unconscious way, way down. Why? Because we have all taken showers 10,000 times before it becomes yeah. automatic, habitual, repetitive behavior. We don't have to focus on it. We don't have to think about it. We're just kind of on automatic pilot. And as a result, are sort of floodgates open to these um, sort of, I would say suppressed, but these back of mind ideas, bits of information, thoughts, associations, they can all start bubbling to the surface now because we've kind of opened up those doors. And that's why in the middle of the shower, most of us some point in our lives go, oh yeah, wait, I've been, hadn't been thinking about it, but suddenly this solution to a problem I've been working with has jumped into my head. I better, you know, jump out of the shower and write it down now, which is a good piece of advice, folks, by the way, uh, something called idea capture, which is to say, if you get a good idea, you want to have the means to record it at hand as quickly as possible. Because you may think, oh, when I get back to my desk, I'll, write, I'll deal with it then. 90% of those quick ideas will fade from memory because our brains are just engineered to kind of move things in and out quickly unless we capture them and turn the, convert them into long-term memory. So believe it or not, in a shower, there are uh, waterproof pads and pencils that are designed to stick against your tile or whatever wall wow. where you can literally, while you're showering, write it down and it's gonna be there in perfect you know, uh, visibility when you get out or obviously you can do it uh, in the bathroom itself or just outside the bathroom, but really get it down real fast. Obviously if we're out in the world, we can use our smartphones or a pad and pencil, keep one by your bed as well, because a lot of idea generation is happening while we sleep for the same reasons we just talked about showering versus skiing, because our uh, 
conscious mind obviously is quieted and a lot of things are churning away in our brains, the trick being to capture them when you wake up either in the morning or in the middle of the night. Uh, Donald, I did not know about those waterproof uh, notepads. Yes, that's a great, you're, yes, a lot of practical tips. And, yeah. you know, I'm trying to recapture some questions I had uh, last night, in fact, to ask you. I'm trying to, they're coming to me slowly, actually. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, going back to the, those uh, comments you made about how we are most creative when we're not, you know, when we're not really thinking, right, in that subcon subconscious uh, state. Uh, so I know Salvador Dali had a trick, right, that when he held a spoon, uh, as he, uh, right about the time when he was falling asleep, he had a spoon and a tin plate on the floor, uh, that, which would wake him up and allow him to capture those ideas. And he shared that with his students. But you told me, you taught me that he may have stolen that from, he may have taken that from Thomas Edison, right? When we spoke. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Edison apparently yeah. would take naps in his uh, study at, uh, in his factory, which I've actually had the pleasure of visiting and people can go see it. It's yeah. in uh, New Jersey, Menlo Park, New Jersey. Oh. Uh, the National Park Service uh, site now. So you can actually see the original workshop and his office. So apparently he would have, you know, a nice comfortable chair. He liked to take naps. And there's another great uh, sort of technique for folks to generate ideas. And he would hold some steel ball bearings in his hand, right? Yep. You kind of hold them in your hand. And as you nod off, you know, your hand just kind of drifts down, your fingers unlock and crash. The steel bearings would cra uh, crash onto his wood floor, make a big noise, wake him up, and he would immediately jot down whatever was kind of in his mind in that liminal we call it liminal like subliminal liminal meaning threshold state uh -huh. between weakness yes. and sleep and that was his technique and i guess it worked for him because you know he's thomas edison so right right <laughs> yeah still where you can uh, you know whether it's from bali or uh, edison or me or you um feel free to steal everything and anything if it furthers your goals like that yeah, yeah, and I wholeheartedly agree with you about that advice um, about capturing ideas because I always share with my friends, with my uh, colleagues, that the best advice I've ever received from a mentor was from John LaRosa, a cardiologist who was well known, uh, you know, globally. Also happened to be a saxophone player, happens to be a saxophone player and a boxer. Uh, and you know, I we had a very long conversation with him, and he told me, Tim. You cannot share ideas with the world that you do not capture. Make sure to get a diary. And he told me that many years ago. And yeah, to this day, it's one of my one of the best advice I've ever received. He was um, uh, he was right on the mark. Yes, Donald. I want to also ask you about the stress management and the implications of what you advise on how we deal with stress. And what role does stress have on creativity? So I would say, generally speaking, stress is the number one creativity killer. And the reason for this is, you know, a lot of this gets back to this kind of bifurcation of our mental functions, right? Between left brain, right brain, analytic, creative. They're almost mirror images of each other in terms of their characteristics. So what stress um, basically meant to us originally, going back to that African savanna scenario, is that we were in some kind of danger, that we were open to potential for harm, right? That's how our bodies evolved to send signals to our brain through stress to say, uh, we got a situation here, we need to get out of this uh, and survive another day. Uh, as a result, uh, stress generally leads us into a left brain analytical mode of thinking because in most situations, that's the best mechanisms we can use to get ourselves out of that predicament, right? To think mm -hmm. clearly, to be alert, to be focused, to be aware of our surroundings. All of these left brain characteristics will, as I say, allow us to escape whatever is potentially causing us harm or literally causing us harm. Uh, whereas the flip side then becomes true as well. The absence of stress, where we feel relaxed, where we feel safest, literally and figuratively, tends to boost idea generation because creativity by its nature is a risky business, right? When you're in a business meeting or with a group and you're throwing out ideas that are just like off the wall because sometimes right. that's what creativity requires, yes. you're taking a risk that people like look at you, are you some kind of weirdo or, oh, that guy, he's, he's right, going right. nowhere in this organization. And people do 
unfortunately tend to withdraw and become much more uh, self-conscious about taking those kind of risks because they don't want to jeopardize their position in the organization or what have right. you, or they're yeah. standing in other people's eyes. And that's a real problem. That's where culture and organizational policy does become very important, that people have to feel safe in their environment mentally and physically. Now, there are all sorts of cues, even if you're talking about yourself in your own home workspace or office, that do signal danger or the lack thereof. And they touch on a lot of things that you would never imagine uh, might impact your thinking that way. For example, the shape of your furnishings, the face, shape of the objects in your space. Uh, think about curved elements versus straight. Think about a sofa or an easy chair, which is mostly straight lines, kind of a very modernistic style, yes. uh, as was generally often the case um, uh, in that particular aesthetic versus something very curvy with lots of rounded edges and circular motifs and so on and so forth. Well, those two different pieces of furniture actually impact your brain in two different ways. When the brain sees lots of straight lines, sharp edges, things that come to corners, it goes into that stress mode. In fact, a little piece of our brain called the amygdala, which is our fear management uh, component, it starts getting hyperactive when it sees lots of straight things because right. it doesn't know sofas from saber-toothed tigers. All it wants to say to your brain is, hey, back off, get away, move into stress mode, move into analytical mode. Whereas those curvy things, you know, the soft and fuzzy uh, puppies that we pick up or babies that are all curves and nice, you know, smooth surfaces, they say, oh yeah, engage with them, approach them. Um, and then we move into that safer, more relaxed mindset. So even the shape of your furnishings can change the way you think. Also how you orient yourself within your own space. Say if you're in a home office, you know, a lot of people, they tend to sort of take their desks and sort of push it up against the wall. So they're facing the wall. Uh, and as a result, their back is to the room and the space behind them. Well, this would, let's call it, violate or contradict a concept known as prospect refuge. So the idea here is, again, looking at evolutionary psychology, we are as humans programmed to seek out positions in space that afford us maximum prospect, meaning view. So seeing everything in front of you 180 degrees, because that's pretty much all the head can sort of sweep, but at the same time, give us a sense of protection in our blind spots behind us, to our sides, overhead. So you can see I have the wall behind me, you have the wall behind you. Uh, we have the ceiling obviously overhead, but we can both see into our spaces. And as a result, again, we feel most relaxed, most safe, because we can see anybody coming and going. Nobody can sneak up on us. Not that anybody's going to do it in our home office. Well, maybe our kids will. I suppose <laughs> that can happen. Right. But back in the day, you know, a hostile tribesman or a, uh, a saber-toothed tiger, as we say, comes up behind you. You don't want to have him uh, see you before you can see him. So again, all of these things are legacies because evolution moves too slowly for us to adapt this soon into our new circumstances. Maybe a couple of million years from now it won't be the case. But right now we have in a sense, stone age brains and space age bodies or space age environments. Yeah. And there where you get these funny anomalies as a result. That's very interesting, particularly for me as well, because I've studied organizational change and I've invited organizational change and organizational behavior specialists and researchers uh, who contribute to Forbes and Harvard Business Review here, Ron Carucci, Zach Mercurio. What also what I took away from your comments there is that that safe environment that you create not only increases productivity and you know collaboration, but creativity as well. The safe based on your comments there. So speaking of meetings, as we are now go, getting back into meetings, uh, and uh, uh, many of us are opening up, and uh, because of uh, you know pandemic that's being controlled now, um, not all of us are spending time virtually. So what are some tips you have to create the right meeting and arrangements that can stimulate creativity and innovation? Well, the big thing there actually ties into furnishings as well. So folks think about uh, meeting rooms, right? Where you're gathering with a group of people. And if I ask you, what's the shape of the table in that space? I would venture to say that 90, 95% of us would answer, oh, rectangular, right? So who's sitting at the end of the table? Probably the team leader, the project leader, somebody of authority. And then everybody else is obviously gathered around the sides. Uh, the folks who tend to sit closest to that uh, project leader tend to be the ones who are really looking for, you know, a power in a sense or to be closer to power. Whereas the people sitting way in the back there, they may be the more uh, shy or introverted people and they kind of want to 
stay in the background. And let's say you're having a brainstorming session and like, okay, like you'll, let's start throwing out ideas here. Well, if the person at the head of the table throws out an idea, how do you think people around it are going to react more often than not? They're going to be probably pretty positive about it because, you know, who's going to stand, tell the boss that, no, his idea doesn't really yeah. work or yada, yada, yada. Uh, but if you take that very same idea and give it to that person down in the corner, well, you know, maybe it'll fly, but there's just as good a chance that it won't by virtue of where people sit in that space. And that's clearly not what you want in a creative environment. You want ideas to be evaluated on the basis of their merits, not on who originated them. Uh, there are other uh, problems that uh, come into play in that kind of a table as well. You can't see everybody equally well, right? If you're sitting in one corner and you want to talk to the person on the same side, but in the opposite corner, you know what you have to do. You have to sort of stick your neck out, literally have to turn your head. It's very uncomfortable. You say what you say to them, and then you naturally sort of lean back. And there again, they have done studies where the amount of conversation between different points around the table is very unequal by mm -hmm. virtue of how easy it is to talk to the person across from you or next to you or down the line. And there again, that rubs against the idea that you want to have this conversation just flying all over the place. So what do you do about it? Well, one possibility is to trade in that rectangular table for a circular one now, right? Think what happens. There's no like special hierarchically privileged position. Everybody's equidistant to the center of the table, right? No matter who mm -hmm. you are. So in a sense, the center of the table becomes like an idea basket into which everything just kind of jumps or gets thrown into and it can be churned around. You can see everybody, even the people next to you just by the fact that they're arced slightly uh, to your side. So through peripheral vision or just slight turn of the head, we're all in com communication with each other. And then another possibility is, you know what? Get rid of the table altogether. Um, have people on uh, ottomans, these little movable cubes or soft seating that can just be very flexible and flexibility of space is another big issue here. You want space that's very flexible, adaptable to whether it's a conversation or you're having a whiteboard presentation or what have you so that things can move around. And creativity is by its nature something that wants flexibility of mind as well as of space because you constantly want to be looking from different angles and thinking about a problem from different perspectives, not the one you're always accustomed to because that tends to give us tunnel vision yep. to have us come up with the same ideas or approach time and time again. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you externalize ideas and capture them uh, in creative ways? Uh, whiteboards, uh, do you suggest those in those meetings? I uh, love whiteboards. Um, I mean, we talked about obviously on a personal level, if you're just out right. on your own to capture yes. them, but you mentioned whiteboards, and there's also something called whiteboard paint. So uh -huh. you can turn your entire wall at home uh, into a whiteboard wall, or you can certainly do it in the office. And in the office. Some of them that go on for like hundreds of feet. And what's great about those particularly, both at home, but in particular the office, is that when people are doing a scribbling ideas or just kind of trying things out in a public space on these whiteboards, you know, people walking by might say, oh, I've been working on the same problem. Uh, we should talk about that. Or you've already finished your doodle and you've gone and gone back to your desk and someone sees it and says, oh, I should talk to so-and-so about that problem. The idea of getting it out into the open means you have greater chances of collaboration, of greater chances of getting feedback, of developing the idea. And that's another big point about this, I should also say, which is we can only do so much in our minds, right? We have to get it out of our heads just so we can play with our own ideas. Absolutely. I mean, Einstein, when he died, he left something like 10,000 pages of notebooks. This is Einstein, right? So he's got to work it out with a pencil. He's got to think about it externally. Uh, if he does, we probably do too. So, uh, you know, this is where technology, as much as I get, I, I, I love it and use it to a great extent. It can only take us so far. Good old hand movement, just the hand itself right. has been found to help idea generation Absolutely. because think about ideas. They don't just go from the head to the hand. They actually go the way back the opposite direction too, from the hand to the head. So if you're dealing with physical products and you have a piece of clay that you can model or you can just doodle with a pencil as you think, all of these things have been shown to boost that idea flow. Oh, yeah. For me personally, I'm a very visual person. And uh, 
uh, about two years ago, I invested in a whiteboard here. I do many of my, my videos, prepare them before or actually in real time. I, I teach, you know, on Mondays Perfect. and Fridays. So Perfect. yeah, they've helped me a great deal. One, one study also that I liked uh, reading about is uh, from a trade show which described the different ways people behaved in different environments as a group. Can you just uh, briefly touch on that? uh, Sure. Yeah. So in 2006, uh, this is at the Architectural Digest trade show in New York City, which is actually Mm -hmm. in my field. It's a big, um, you know, building industry, design industry trade show. It happens on the New York City Pier. So we're talking about a huge, Mm -hmm. you know, very tall ceiling structure, obviously, in which there are a lot of booths and so forth. Yeah. Uh, so in that year, an architect actually by the name of Shashi Khan set up a series of event tents, right? So they could bring in these, you know, pretty sizable tents. So you might see at a party or something of that sort. So in one tent, she colorized the lighting. It was all blue. So the color like theater lighting, but she made everything that wasn't the light uh, white. So it would all look very bluish. People wore hazmat suits, white hazmat suits <laughs> wow. to cover up their clothing. Uh, The furnishings was white, even the food and the beverages with which she, of course, bribed people to come in and hang out for a while uh, were either clear or white. So it's a pure chromatic experience. And then she did exactly the same thing. But this time she did a second tent in red. And then she kind of looked through the peepholes, as it were, and watched how people behave. What was fascinating is that the people in the blue tent, remember, this is the color I mentioned earlier on as being a sort of catalyst for creativity. They tended to move out to the perimeter of the tent and they did so in ones and twos. And that to me is almost an embodiment, a physical embodiment of creative thinking in that creativity tends to happen either individually or with maybe one other person kind of bouncing out before you get into that sort of group innovation phase. And also it's that sense of testing boundaries, right? Going where no one has gone before to those outer limits. Whereas in the red tent, she noticed that people tended to huddle in the middle as if that color or those walls were pushing them inward and they tended to do so in large groups, kind of a simulation of group think, right? Where we're all sort of huddled together almost for safety. And here, by the way, red is a kind of stressor color, right? Because the color red raises alarms, blood and danger, and stop signs. So there's that left brain thinking mode, um, just a fascinating, you know, divergency, literal opposite behaviors based purely on color, none of which, by the way, was told to these people, oh, we're going to experiment uh, on how color affects your brain thinking. You never tell the subjects what you're really up to. You give some excuse as to why you're doing what you're doing, but you want people to react naturally without being self-conscious and therefore skewing the results as a consequence. Uh, Donald, I have only a few questions left that I thought about. One is regarding sound, because you talked about the five senses. So what role does sound play in our creativity, background sound? So there's an interesting experiment where they tried to kind of identify the sweet spot for peak idea generation. And what they did through trial uh, and experimentation is to establish a decibel level of 70, 70 decibels as being this kind of perfect sound level, not too loud, not too soft, where people came up with the most original and unique uh, responses to creative problems. Now, a couple of things about that sound. It's not just any old sound. It needs to be white noise, right? So white noise is like background sound, such as if you're in a coffee shop on a medium busy day and there's just chatter and clinking of glasses and all of that, that would be a form of white noise, which might explain why all those creative types hang out in there for hours on end on their laptops, yeah. uh, but also you know, crashing ocean waves, crickets at night, that kind of a sound, running water, shower, which may be another reason why a shower is such a good idea, incubate. Um, so that the idea here is, you know, and look, every time we try to explain why do people respond, why is 70 decibels the sweet spot, we have to kind of theorize. We can't prove with like the same certainty we can prove that two plus two equals four, yeah. uh, but we have, you know, people can bring in evidence and kind of uh, establish a narrative that makes sense. So in this case, the idea being is that just enough background noise kind of takes the edge off of your focus, right? Pulls you out of that left brain, very self-conscious, very alert, very focused thinking, and puts you a little bit more into that sort of mind wandery loose kind of frame of mind that is more conducive to idea generation. And caveat here, however, mentioned earlier, introvert versus extrovert. So introverts at the extreme end of the spectrum, they hear a pin drop, they go crazy, right? And the sound really bothers them. So forget 70 decibels. If you're at the introverted end of the spectrum, you don't want any sound 
And that's where these kind of human differences must come into play when you're dealing with data like this. But for the bell curve, the center of the bell curve, the bulk of us who are a little bit between introvert and extrovert, that 70 decibels may be the way. Now, if you're at home and you live in a very quiet place like I do, you can generate sounds. There are apps now that will give you crashing ocean waves if that helps you um, kind of get into the mood. Uh, music, of course, is another sound input that people have used to boost creativity as well. That has its own parameters, but interesting to see um, where basic noise fits into the equation. Uh, Donald, how would you ideally see people who read your book utilize the tips that you share? Certainly to see an improvement in your own creativity and, you know, creativity, when we're speaking here, we're not just talking about the arts and design and so on and so forth. The creativity has expanded its definition in the last 50 years, 70 years even, to include any kind of discipline or activity for which a novel and useful idea can be generated. And those can be very minor problems like fixing the link under your sink, the leak under your sink, <laughs> to more weighty issues such as yeah. business development or you're making a marketing campaign or you're writing proposal for your next book or so on and so forth. So I want folks to understand what we're talking about when we're saying creativity. So if I see that anybody has A, implemented some of these techniques or tried to utilize them, maybe one at a time or in multiple, and have found it to actually improve their work product, to improve their creative thinking, but also to make them happier and healthier. Remember, all these things are on the same spectrum. Environmental inputs that tend to improve the one tend to do the same for the others and vice versa. The ones that suppress or disrupt the one tends to do the same the other. So if you feel any kind of positive result from this, I'm very happy. That's, that's why I wrote the book. Well, I do. Well, I absolutely do. And I know uh, many others as well um, who will find this very useful, very inspiring. I uh, think that we are at a time where we need a renaissance of new ideas, just like four centuries ago, because I think the renaissance has still left many trademarks and works uh, of art and masterpieces that are un un unsurpassed to this day in terms of the beauty, the wisdom, and where you had people who questioned the art for its value in society, not just for art alone itself, but uh, you had financial moguls who invested lots of their uh, money in philosophers. So, uh, I mean, your ideas about, you know, that seesaw effect and, uh, you know, about, you know, how, how our environment influences how we think it also reminds me of uh, Kahneman and Tversky's work, Nobel Prize uh, winners, who, uh, who suggested the two different ways of thinking, two systems of thought, right? The more intuitive versus the more analytical one, with the key becoming how to match the right system of thinking to the right situation. And so with your ideas uh, about the creativity as well, how to stimulate creativity, I think I have just, you know, unlimited potential in how we can go about our work. Well, I'm always fascinated by independent thinkers like you uh, and others uh, who cross the boundary, who challenge the uh, status quo and who really, you know, break new ground. I'm grateful to you for inspiring us, to challenging us to think m more about how we think about our environment. Any final takeaways or thoughts you want to share with the All Out Coach audience, Donald? Well, simply that, you know, space matters. Um, clearly what's inside of us matters, but also what's around us matters. And if you can bring the two into kind of an equilibrium, I think you'll find, um, you know, life just that much more enjoyable and rewarding. And it's interesting when you talk about science, um, you know, the idea of uh, kind of expanding yourself to the to the opposite ends of human capabilities. They've done studies where people are, or scientists are more likely to win the Nobel Prize in Sciences if they also have hobbies like music. And even more extreme, they're 27 times more likely than other scientists to win the Nobel Prize if they like to do acting and dance, right, in their spare time. So the idea of exercising that full range of human capabilities of looking without to space and environment, but also looking within in terms of your self and personality, that's, um, I think, the ultimate goal for all of us to kind of strive towards. And, and thank you for all the the kind comments, Tim, I really appreciate it. It's been a really enjoyable conversation and I, I thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. And I invite you to All Out Coach again and any with any projects you will have in the future, you're always welcome. Thank uh, you, Tim. Continue. I will be back. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you, Donald.